thank you so, so much for the opportunity to allow me to share my recent uh, studies and results on the updates in coxidiodomycosis with you. Um, I have no dis uh, conflict of interest to disclose for this um, uh, talk. Um, my objectives are, um, one is just an overview of the clinical presentation and challenges that are involved with the diagnosis and treatment of valley fever, and specifically on the, um, you know, uh, fellows side. If you have any question as I go on, please feel free uh, to stop me and um, I'll be happy to listen to your questions and hopefully be able to answer your questions. Uh, the second part, I'd like to talk to you about the approaches we have taken over the past couple of years to improve uh, the valley fever diagnosis and early diagnosis here in Tucson, Arizona. You would be surprised. We live in the epicenter of this disease in the country. However, um, there are a lot of misses. There are a lot of delays in diagnosis that you will see in a few slides when I go over that with you. Um, and then at the end, I'd like to talk about the ongoing research that I am doing right now, which is the management of COXI patients who are on BRM. So I will start with the overview of the clinical presentation. As you know, um, COXI is, uh, or valley fever, or the other word for it is Sam Joaquin valley fever, caused by COXI, coxidiodes imitis, and coxidiodes posodaceae. And when I present this in person, I always ask the audience, you know, the fellows, what do you think the difference is? So anybody has a, any answer for me? What do you think the difference between emetis and posodacia are, if any of the fellows are available? Is the location, like which state they're located in? I think one is more California, one is more Arizona. Is that what it is? I can't remember which, which though. You are very close, yes, sir. Um, I, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name, but you were right. Uh, Coxy imitis is mainly in California, and Coxidios this posodacia is elsewhere. So in, in Arizona, and expanding to Texas, and even now in Washington State, we have isolated some Coxy uh, Coxidios posodacia. Um, other names for it, as I said, San Joaquin Valley fever. Coxidiodomycosis, and we love abbreviations, so we use COXI, and I'll tell you why we, we use that uh, abbreviation in a few slides. Um, we know that approximately the minimum is 150,000 people per year catch it as new infection, although the new CDC um, statistics takes it up to almost 450,000. It can be caused with one single spore, so um, I hate to say that you could land in Phoenix airport to go and do a nice short vacation and you could catch that. So be very careful when you come over. Um, spectrum of the disease in 60% of cases, people don't even know they had it. Very mild, maybe flu-like symptom and it goes away. About 30% of patients are those that we do have some upper respiratory tract infection, kind of pneumonia picture, but it's still it's self-limited self and resolves. And then in 10% of cases, they, be, they become very complicated. About 3% of these people are those that uh, have uh, disseminated coxy. So we really have to be careful about not missing these groups. Uh, we know that after the infection, <clears throat> people who catch that develop lifelong immunity. And this is one of the questions patients ask us all the time. So they do develop, <clears throat> excuse me, lifelong immunity, but they could develop reactivation if their immune system goes down. So you have to remember that. that sometimes they call it second infection. It's actually really reactivation. Um, this is a new uh, map that actually CDC just published um, if you look at older maps in CDC website, you see that there is only like California involvement and Arizona. And as we go on, uh, we, ha we have expansion of the area to the point that there are cases reported in even Washington state. Uh, this is the beautiful Sonoran Desert that I'm in inviting you to come and visit us with. And if you look at the the life cycle of the disease, the mycelium is what you have in the soil about three inches below the surface. 
The salinity of soil here in Tucson, in actually Arizona, between Tucson and Phoenix is perfect for this fungus. So it grows and it develops into arthroconidia. And then by inhalation, human or animals can catch that. By the way, dogs are very susceptible to this disease. So arthroconidia then after entering into, into the body uh, becomes the parasitic life cycle, which is slowly growing into this large spherical shape um, structure. We call it spherical. One of these become about 300. This is about three micron in diameter, and this is about 300 micron with about 300 endospores in it. So when they mature, they rupture and the life cycle goes on. And if you see here, I put here th five days. Uh, this is usually the time frame that um, from the um, acquiring the disease to the time that patients have early presentation, it takes about a week or so. Uh, maximum by about two weeks, patients have some symptoms. Um, you know, we like to think that we are the center of the world in Arizona. <laughs> So, of course, this is the, the world view of us in, in Arizona. And as you see here, Valley Fever Corridor is between Phoenix and Tucson, and about two-thirds of all cases are in this area. Just to give you an example of the whole um, distribution of the disease, to, uh, Arizona is about 7 million, the population. About 5 million live in this area. And out of those five million, then two thirds of them could potentially have the disease. So it's not a simple and um, um, rare disease, at least when it comes to this area. Um, so common mild self limited valley fever, sign and symptom about lesser than a month from exposure. People develop cough, chest pain, fever and weight loss. And I just want to emphasize this past 2020 with COVID being everywhere, we had so many misdiagnoses of valley fever because literally people stopped thinking about other diseases except COVID. So lots of these patients did not get diagnosed early enough just because of that. And as you see, we have a lot of overlap in presentation with all of the upper respiratory tract infections. Um, Lots of patients develop very severe fatigue, which is real, and sometimes patients are really begging us to believe them that it is, it's true. We know it is true, but unfortunately, not everybody else in the area knows how fatigue, uh, how extreme fatigue these people could have. They develop bone and joint pain, and that's the reason they call it desert rheumatism. And the other thing is sometimes these people, um, at the first um, evaluation is in the dermatology office with either the erythema nodosum, painful and intense itching. Sometimes they have erythema multiformis. They go through a whole set of, uh, you know, studies and testing until finally somebody thinks about valley fever. So courses of illness, it could be weeks to months. 25% of the college student here in our campus health uh, reported to be sick with this more than four months. And about 50% of people who reported in uh, Arizona Department of Health at least lost about two weeks of work. So it has a lot of social and economical effect in the, in the community here where it is very common. Um, now, as you see here, um, in uh, Arizona community acquired pneumonia, obviously one third of these cases could be coccyx. So take a guess how much of these people actually t get diagnosed. Lesser than 15% of these people get tested for coxy. So um, when we did some survey with the uh, Arizona Medical, Li Medical Board, uh, we know that about 1,000 new medical licenses are issued in Arizona per year. 12% of them receive their education here in Arizona, and thereby we assume that they remember what they studied in medical school and they are familiar with the disease presentation. 40% were coming from elsewhere. 80% of uh, physicians that we surveyed did not know that valley fever is reportable to Arizona Department of Health, and um, they didn't know that the vaccine doesn't exist. Now, I always say that I have to add actually a parenthesis here. One of the studies we have done over the past four years is development of a canine vaccine. 
and we are hoping by the end of this year that that gets um, to the field uh, trial. Um, hopefully by next year it's available for uh, you know use in the market. And the next step that we are actually working on is um, applying for a grant for human vaccine. And this is using a, a live a virulent strain of coxie. So uh, this line, I may have to change it in, in maybe for future presentation to you guys. And the other thing is 40% of clinician that somehow they diagnosed the disease, they were not confident to treat it. So what happens is a lot of these patients are sent to our clinic, which becomes very hard because it's just me and um, John, Dr. Galgiani, and thereby we have a very long waiting time. So we like to expand this knowledge to uh, the private practitioners and primary care physicians to help patient and increase the access of patient to care for this. Uh, this is a study that we did. This is Banner University Medical Center in Phoenix, and same study I did here in Tucson. And in both the study, we show that no matter what presentation of disease it is, even disseminated disease, we had more than a month of delay in diagnosis. And this is, I'm talking about Tucson or Phoenix, Arizona. We are not talking about, say, Rochester, New York, that people are not familiar. So you see how important it is to actually uh, raise awareness for the disease and um, educate people to diagnose the disease, to decrease the morbidities and mortalities that comes with the delay in diagnosis for patients. Uh, so what did several weeks of delay in diagnosis mean for patients? Of course, you know, uh, in one study that we have done, we have seen that about median number of antibiotic courses for these patients are three and median number of days that each course has been given is 10. So at average or median three courses, about one month of antibiotic that is absolutely unnecessary is given to these patients. A lot of anxiety and fear happens in these patients because they are not responding to whatever treatment is being given to them. So um, at the same time, there are a lot of CT imaging and bronchoscopies and trochotomies and all these procedures that really uh, can be minimized if we improve the early diagnosis of the disease. So our hypothesis was early diagnosis could improve the outcome of these patients and reduce the cost and decrease the fear and anxiety that patients have. Um, <clears throat> this is another uh, study we did in Banner Medical Group and Banner University Medical Group in two years, patients with community-acquired pneumonia. And you see here that the total number of patients were about 2,200 uh, in two years. And in um, out of these 2,200, if you say one-third of this population could have COXI, then about, I would say, 700 or so patients should have been tested. Take a look. We have only one out of 40 that have been tested or presumed to have COXI and thereby have been tested. And then when they do test these people, see how many of them are positive, about almost 80%. So we have a long way to go to increase the awareness, improve the education here to actually help with patients' outcome. The second objective is now what did we do about this? How, what are our approaches that we have taken to improve this early diagnosis? So we have a tutorial. This is on our website, Valley Fever Center for Excellence. And we usually, um, every year, early July, we have a lecture for Valley Fever for the newcomers, residents in internal medicine, our new fellows, the pulmonology fellows, the residents and fellows that come to emergency room, both on pediatric and adult infectious disease, and really for um, the community hospitals in the area and even private practices. We kind of reach out to them to tell them what this disease is about and how they can approach the patient and if needed, how they can treat or reach out, reach to us to actually help them with the treatment. In this tutorial, this is the mnemonic we use. Consider um, the diagnosis, order the right test, check for the risk factor, check for the complication, and initiate the management. And that's the reason we love COXI. So 
consider the diagnosis. Um, we, we know that in Arizona and California, it's very common and thereby it should be in the differential diagnosis, especially for people who have the presentation of community acquired pneumonia. Um, we know in um, several studies that have been done that has a bimodal peak in, in year, uh, right before monsoon season, uh, we have a very rain, rainy season in about, I would say late Ju June, early July. So right before that, when the soil is really dry, and also before the rain, um, winter time rain, which is in maybe late November, early December, soil is very dry, so you're at higher highest risk for acquiring the disease. Um, always in community acquired pneumonia, consider COXI, especially if you are in this area. Um, if patients come in with these weird rheumatism pictures with no previous history, or if they have these weird rashes, always keep that in mind. Um, this is a, a lecture we use for dermatology residents also, and it's amazing that when we give the lecture, usually the first two or three months, they remember it, so we have some referrals, and then it slowly goes down. So um, the next step is ordering the right test, and I don't know if you have ever encountered this disease um, to order the test, but the best screening test we do is enzyme immunoassay, ELISA test for both IgG and IgM, and uh, has a great positive predictive value, very high positive predictive value, so it's very specific, but the question is, if it is negative, can you rule out the disease? And it's really not. So what we usually um, do in these cases is, it could be the uh, it's too early for development of antibodies, or it could be that it's just waning off. So sometimes we repeat the test to make sure we are not missing positive diagnosis. Um, you know that the test we are using is Meridian, which is made in actually um, Indiana, and uh, the best has a sensitivity of about 50%. That's the one that is in the market now for Quest Lab and Sonora Quest. So you see one out of two patients could potentially get missed just using that test. Um, now, for the check-in for the risk factors, in the pulmonary case, the complication may happen when patients have diabetes. And it's amazing um, that diabetic patients um, have more necrosis in their lung and develop cavitary lesion, much more than uh, patients who do not have diabetes. Also, any other cardiopulmonary disease, uh, especially COPD, could be a risk factor. For the disseminated disease, though, in the major and critical uh, risk factors is cell-mediated immune deficiency. So HIV is in that category, obviously, and pregnancy. And then in the minor and small uh, risk factor, male gender is always more at risk than female, and uh, racial background. And again, I'm going to ask another fellow, do you think we do you know which one of the racial backgrounds are at higher risk for disseminated coxie? Well, that would be African Americans and Filipinos. So the young lady that was a patient in Orlando, I was presented two weeks ago, was a, a little girl um, from a Filipino mom and dad. So. Actually, I asked them to, uh, I asked the physician to call the family and see if they'd like to enroll in one of our studies to do some genetic analysis for them. Also, adults are more at risk than children. Now, for checking for the complication, what do we really do? When they come to our office, usually they have gone to other, you know, providers' offices and now they get to us. We do a very thorough review of system. Uh, reviewing if there is any headaches that is out of ordinary, any specific back pain, any specific joint pain or loss of function. And in physical exam, we try to make sure we examine the skin specifically very thoroughly to make sure there's no uh, ongoing small lesions that we may miss, subcutaneous fluctuation, joint effusions. These are all could be evidence of dissemination. Um, these are a couple of examples of disease in, say, 
thin wall, simple cavity. Some patients, they have this cavity and they don't even know this is incidental finding. And sometimes it becomes very complex. This is a patient who, who was diabetic with uh, several area of involvement and thicker wall cavities. Um, this is a transplant patient with cutaneous cocci, disseminated cocci. And um, actually, she, uh, there was another patient very similar to this patient who went through bilateral lung transplant and was on treatment. And uh, we were very worried about her uh, potential recurrence of her disseminated cocci, but so far she has been doing great. Um, this is a, a skin involvement on the knee joint, if I'm not mistaken. And these are like, you see that here, it's like a verruca-like lesion. There is some fullness at the bottom of it if you touch that. It's very minimally tender, sometimes it's pruritic, and sometimes they drain a little bit of, you know, pussy material. If you culture those, they are positive. Remember, when we have erythema nodosum or erythema multiformis, that's part of the immune response. So even if you biopsy and culture it, they don't grow anything. These are evidence of disseminated cocci, so they are positive in culture. Um, another patient with soft tissue and deep tissue involvement and ultimately osteomyelitis. This gentleman had paravertebral abscess, uh, immunocompromised host, and then the subcutaneous collection, this was drained and it grew cocci. Um, another patient with synovial involvement, and you see that this is almost opening up here. Uh, again, culture was positive. Um, soft tissue with deep tissue involvement and ultimately osteomyelitis in a young patient. Um, so for patients, we like to always when they come back and visit us in follow-ups to check for complications. Most of these complications are focal. So a good review of system, a good physical exam usually can detect these. And a lot of times we know that if these focal findings have been diagnosed with primary care physician, they usually send the patient to us or pulmonologist or related subspecialty clinics for further evaluation. Um, now, we do get follow-up chest x-rays. We don't get it every month. We sometimes, when we know patients have a nodule, maybe in a year or in six months, we repeat that, unless the pulmonologists like it a little bit more often. But what we like to do is to see if those infiltrates now cavitates, because that becomes an uh, important matter to know, potentially for future planning for patient. Also, we want to see if there is any residual nodule. And I have to tell you this story. I had a patient when I was in Sarasota who um, was uh, actually sent to Moffett because he had history of smoking and there was this nodule and everybody was worried about cancer and the pathology came back positive for spherio and I ended up seeing him in Sarasota where he lived and he was on fluconazole, he was doing great. So um, remember that if you do these x-rays, part of it is to kind of have a baseline x-ray and follow up on these nodules to make sure you don't miss either a mass or a malignancy or you don't overdo it for the uh, approach if that's indeed a nodule related to cocci. Um, we really don't need to get CT once we have the initial finding and a PA and lateral would be sufficient for us to see what we need to follow up on. This is an example of a patient who developed primary coccy pneumonia. You see there is some involvement here. This is October 26. The follow-up x-ray in no November 3rd, you see nice lower pneumonia here. And then gradually by November 14, getting smaller. And then in December when patient had a repeat chest x-ray, almost, almost gone. Um, so in the CT imaging though, the Pulmonary nodules are usually peripheral. They are pleural based, very well demarcated. Now, if this patient um, has history of 10, 10 years of smoking, goes to pulmonologist, I can guarantee they all get biopsy. And a lot of times after the pathology comes back positive for uh, spherules, that's when these patients are sent to us. But just keep that in mind, they are very well demarcated. They are usually peripherally based. So 
What about the serology? Um, you know, when patient improve, this coxidomycosis CF complement fixation titer slowly goes down. How slow is acceptable for you? It could be a couple of weeks, it could be several months, it could be a year or so. So be patient with that. It depends on the patient's baseline immune system, and uh, you just have to give reassurance to patients. Now, how about the titer if it goes up? And in that case, usually what we do is bring the patient in, do a physical complete exam and review of system to make sure we are not missing any of the complication that causes this. And if not, we just consider the titer a marker and we follow that. We don't, you know, um, as long as we have con concluded that the dissemination is excluded, we could follow and monitor this. Um, to that end, actually, uh, speaking of serology, I've done a study, this is a prospective study we did for a novel rap rapid lateral flow assay, which is like a dipstick assay that is made by um, IMI in um, Kansas, I think they are located now. Um, this was a rapid lateral flow. The company claims that this is 30 minutes flow, uh, 30 minutes testing, and we can obviously use this as an early diagnosis tool. Uh, the specificity of this test in compared to our normal EIA test is very good, but, or almost comparable, but the sensitivity is not as good. So although this could be a, a way to improve our early diagnosis, uh, but it hasn't been final yet to be used in the market is the same company who made this uh, lateral flow assay for cryptococcus and was very successful. So they are working on that. Um, the last symptom, usually the primary pulmonary coxy is could be very symptomatic and sometimes it's only uh, uh, diagnosed ser serologically for other reasons. But how about weeks and um, weeks passes by after the pulmonary coxies comes and goes, and uh, patient's weight comes back to normal, they, their fever, their pulmonary symptom goes away, their ESR gets normalized, the complement fixation gets normalized or it's very low, but patient develop this profound fatigue that sometimes comes from literally day one of the disease and doesn't go away forever, as, as far as patient tell us. So remember that this fatigue is true and actually affects the patient's life so much that they get so frustrated with it. So how do we manage that? Um, John has done some study in Phoenix with a rehab physician group, and they have shown that um, oxygen utilization in muscles go down when coxidomycosis actually happen. So, uh, in addition to that, a lot of patients who develop this, they are people who are outdoors, they do stuff out, so they are very active. And the disease itself and the fatigue make them very, very tired. So they get very deconditioned. And then now they're, they don't have, because these are active people, they don't have any experience with being disabled, so that makes them even more frustrated. So our job is actually to reassure them that this is part of the disease. Uh, we have to tell them to, I, I always ask them to develop, to have a diary of what they can or cannot do, like say every Monday morning, write down what you can do. And then next Monday, put something down and say how many miles you walked this week. And then I ask them to kind of follow up on that and they see how they can slowly improve their ability to do daily activities. And that actually makes them very happy. So uh, the, the solution to their fatigue is really not antifungal agents. And then the last step of the um, tutorial that we have is initiate the management. In the IDSA guideline that we have, if you look at it carefully, there is no randomized trial that assess whether antifungal treatment either shorten the duration of the disease uh, of early uncomplicated coxy or prevents later complication. So to this end, the question is, 
do we really need to treat uncomplicated pulmonary coxy or not? And um, Neil Ampel um, uh, did a study here in 2009 showing that 50 patients were treated. These are uncomplicated pulmonary coxy. 50 of them treated with antifungal and 50 of them were not treated. And you see that there, from the time or days of disease presentation, there was no difference between the two groups. Also, uh, when he followed those people who did not get any antifungal up to three years, there was no complication. However, when you look at the people who got treated, and some of them came off the treatment in three to six months, that's the routine here in the area. Uh, five of them wanted to stay on the treatment. That's patient's choice. They wanted to stay. They were afraid of discontinuing the medication. And out of those 38, eight of them relapsed. And out of those eight, three of them had extra pulmonary disseminated disease. And this was up to two years after stopping the medication. So putting all of this together, we, we take antifungals very seriously for this disease. And unless we absolutely have to treat these people, we really take our time initiating the treatment because of these important factors that is involved. This is another study that we did while we were doing the prospective study for our um, rapid lateral flow assay. Uh, while we were doing that study, we did a lot of these educational lectures and everything. And as you see, during 2019, early 2020, we had much higher rate of diagnosis of this disease. And this, on the right side, you see that Banner is part of our hospital, and non-Banner are the outside community hospital. And since this was mainly focused in Banner, you see the uptake of diagnosis of the disease. So actually, our, our effort paid back. However, we have to continue that. So the toolkit we have in Ballet Fever Center for Excellence, um, lots of uh, resources here for uh, practitioners uh, and providers here in the area, and the training resources for people who are like yourself in different area. And of course, you know, we are uh, our website and our emails and phone number is in here. So if any of the fellows, you see a patient, you don't know what to do, just give us a call or write on an email and we'll be happy to help you. Now, in the next section, um, I like to talk about what we are doing right now, which is management of COXI patients who are on BRM. And um, the question is, we have an increasing number of biologics, as you know. Almost every day, there is a one or two new agents in the market. And they use those ma medication for lots of different autoimmune diseases, such as RA. And cer certainly, this poses further risk for endemic mycosis. And in our case, COXI is our favorite. Uh, we know that some of these patients, COXI patients who are on BRM, can handle this disease very poorly here. And it has been reported already that risk of disseminated COXI goes up to 150 folds when patients are on immunosuppressive, such as BRM. So a question we get almost every day by our other colleagues or by patient is, is it really safe to take BRMs when we, are, we live here in COXI endemic region? And if, if so, how should we handle this? So what we have done so far to answer this question is development of a, an animal model. This is a mouse, uh, mice model that is uh, B6, D2, F1. These are intrinsically resistant to COXI. And we are using a strain of COXI 1038, which is virulent, but it, it progresses very slowly. So actually gives us enough time to study the animal and the disease progression. In this model, we give the COXI, the 1038 strain, 50 spores intranasally on day minus one. And day, one, day zero, then we give them anti-TNF alpha antibody, which is made for mice. This is from Johnson & Johnson. And either we give them for 14 days or all the way through 70 days of the whole duration of the, the study. And the black group is the isotype as a control group for the antibody. And as you see here, early blockade of TNF has deleterious effect on mice survival. When we block it early, it doesn't matter how much more we go on, they die almost with the same rate. 
So this model is evolving and we have done some other studies with this model and we have actually, uh, we have to verify, but we have some exciting data coming up. Also in um, other part of the study, we have worked on some uh, individuals who have disseminated COXI. This is in collaboration with Dr. Steve Holland and Amy Shu in NIH. And we have seen that disseminated COXI is frequently the consequence of dysregulated or delayed innate responses to initial infection. This was a family of three with disseminated COXI and with gene expression profiling that was done partly here and partly with the NIH group, we found dectin-1 pathway, which is the uh, glucan um, binding pathway, is deficient in these, in these individuals. This is study is still ongoing. So together with our animal model and human model, the next step is evaluating the COXI risk in patients who are on BRN. Uh, we have done a two-year retrospective cohort study. This study just finished, uh, patients more than 18 years, and we reviewed electronic medical ref records using ICD code for autoimmune disease, which is about 10,000 charts, and COXI about 1,300 charts. This, the analysis is still ongoing, so um, these are preliminary results. But we have shown that autoimmune patients who do have COXI, these are positive uh, or red group, versus those who do not have COXI, if we compare the length of residence of the COXI positive patient, they are shorter. That gives us a hint that maybe these patients develop the disease as a new infection, not reactivation. And in the same study, we have so far found 20 patients that have autoimmune disease, COXI, and are on BRM. And out of these 20, we have five of them that are developing, have developed disseminated disease. This actually was done to show that in our next step study that we are going to do, uh, we have enough number of patients to actually build a good uh, power uh, for our study that is coming up hopefully within the next few months. So our hypothesis is that adaptive cellular immunity in patients who have prior COXI will protect them from BRM induced reactivation or new infection. And when they don't have that adaptive immunity, that's when the problem arises. So uh, the strategy is to actually approach this hypothesis is that we are um, uh, designing a prospective study enrolling our A patients starting on BRM. And this was a proposal that we just put in um, NIH for a grant to do this study. Uh, if we get the grant, obviously, our plan is to do the evaluation of cell surface activation markers, such as CD69. And as you know, this is a marker that is just like a, we call it skin test in test tube. Any previous infection could upregulate this when we stimulate the cells again with COXI antigens. So that would give us a hint about previous exposure or not. And also we are planning to analyze several other cytokines. So together with these two um, um, steps, we like to identify the COXI immunity and potential alterations that could happen by biologic response modifiers. At this step, we will be collecting uh, peripheral blood mononuclear cells and we extract the RNA and hopefully we can use this RNA to um, run a gene expression profiling before and after biologics to see what, what potential pathways are involved. And to that, to summary, uh, to summarize what I was talking about, um, our Valley Fever Center for Excellence is changing that um, clinicians uh, here in the area recognize and manage the patients with valley fever. And also central to this change is the importance of educating the practitioners outside of our center uh, to be more comfortable with early diagnosis management uh, of at least uncomplicated valley fever. And then they are always more than welcome to send their patients to us, um, especially if there is some complication that they are not too familiar. And to that, I really thank you for your time and I'm open for any question, please.